Good afternoon, passengers. This is your pilot speaking. We are about to revisit the golden age of flying, a whole other world for those who could nab a ticket. Air travel has a long and wondrous history, from the early prototypes to those revolutionary years of connecting the world. But that really special era around the middle of the 1900s was more like something out of a dream. A dangerous and sometimes unhygienic dream, mind you, but with glamour, grandeur, and most importantly, a whole lot of legroom. I'm your host, Nostalgic Nick, here to revisit this unique time for air travel. And keep watching to find out every outlandish requirement for a 50s flight attendant and what your dinner options are for tonight's flight. As you move your seats to an upright position, be sure to hit that thumbs up icon and subscribe to the channel so you never miss one of our trips. All right, it's time for liftoff. Head in the clouds. Giving man the power of flight had been a dream for centuries when all the big names left their footprints on history. From Da Vinci's flying machine to the Wright brothers' first motor-operated plane. Just when recreational air travel started to get off the ground, pun intended, it was the early 1900s and war had hit the globe twice, which required all possible resources. So when the dust settled, innovation could thrive once again. And that's when we saw a boom in streamlining and improving commercial flights. It's that dance between military advancements and commercial breakthroughs that helped the golden age come to be. An offshoot of a Boeing B-17 bomber became the first to fly high enough it could soar above bad weather. And that was huge when planes themselves weren't always the most sturdy. Costly Commitment those very early commercial flights could host a whopping 30 people. That's up from the average passenger cabin with room for 18. It sounds pretty limiting though, right? Yes and no. Early on, there weren't as many people clambering for a seat because it was a pretty exclusive club. Why? Well, cha-ching, the cost. Let's say you're headed from Chicago to Phoenix. A round trip in the 50s cost 138 bucks, which with inflation would be around $1,100. $168. Then factor in the average American salary was lower in those days, and you'd have to spend roughly 5% of your annual income on that trip. So in those 18 passenger cabins, you'd usually see well-off businessmen or just wealthy people in general. Hollywood Hostesses Glamour defined the golden age of flying. And what else was going through a golden era? Hollywood. So who better to mimic when recruiting an attendant than the starlets of the age? Because of this comparison, becoming a flight attendant was given an air of mystique. But like any exclusive club, not everyone could get in. There were some pretty shocking requirements too. First, airlines wanted someone they thought was pretty. She had to be thin, no more than 135 pounds and had a curvy figure, which the uniforms would play into. But that's not all. She also had to be single and not have any kids. Remember, these are hiring requirements, like when you look for computer experience when you're looking for an IT guy. So no wedding ring, also no glasses. There was a shelf life for the job too. The ideal candidate was in her 20s, and once you reached your 30s, retirement was on the horizon. And make sure you've always got a winning personality with a constant smile. Bye-bye. Hey, you live here in Pittsburgh? Uh, no, actually, I'm here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Heck, some of the original flight attendants were also nurses, having to keep passengers calm through travel anxiety. The words immaculate grooming have also been used, as well as having soft hands, well-kept hair, and makeup. Their work quality did change with the times. By the mid-60s, attendants could keep working even if they were married, but they had to get married after having started the job. And even then, it was kinda considered a mark against her. And when miniskirts came into fashion, you better believe those uniforms sported them. Because, well, yeah, legs. Lap of luxury. Back when air travel wasn't as common, planes had a sort of compromise going on inside. Sure, fewer people fit, but fewer people could afford it too. And that gave the lucky ones room to space out even more. And what a difference it made. The seats were arranged with comfort in mind. 
Are you listening, Spirit Airlines? The biggest example was legroom. Since the dawn of planes, once called flying boats, comfort was the only focus, and for a time, first class was the only class. With such a small audience, there was more room to spare. The seats could be lowered into sleeping berths, and more could be lowered from above. And adding to this cozy feeling was fabric lining everything floor to ceiling. So you could sit back, quite literally, and relax knowing you're catered to with less people requiring flight attendant help. Pass the time. I wonder what movie this flight's showing. Oh yeah, none. There's no touch pads on the back of headrests or iPods to play your favorite Zeppelin album. Of course, you had an out of this world view outside the plane window, but when that wasn't enough, you could always pass the time smoking a cigarette. It is wild to think about now, but smoking was completely allowed, even encouraged. The other big source of fun was the postcards. Once you boarded a flight, you'd get a nice postcard with a picture of the plane you just got on, or a meal you could eat. And the idea was you'd spend the flight writing about the trip to a friend. Dig in. Dining on airplanes kind of went full circle. Closer to the world wars, eating on a plane meant snacking quickly on a box lunch. And now the usual fare again resembles something from the school cafeteria, complete with plastic, disposable dinnerware, and bad food. But of course, that's not good enough for the splendor of air travel's golden age. No, no, I'm talking real glassware, fine china, polished silverware, tablecloths, the works. Again, once innovations for civilian comforts won out over military necessities, planes threw in more amenities. Can you believe this was all standard? Flight attendants cooked up an average of two to three dozen meals in 18 minutes. Come book your flight with Pan Am and you could get a finely cooked chicken, creamy tomato soup, wash it down with some French wine, and wrap it up with a Boston cream pie, and probably a cigarette to call the meal complete. What safety? Heightened airport security began gaining momentum in the 70s, so arriving three hours before your flight is pretty exclusive to the modern era. Jump back to the 50s and you'd probably be fine getting there 30 minutes ahead of takeoff. It's not like there were security gates or x-rays to go through, that's two decades away. And of course, several tragic events inspired stricter security at airports. But in the 50s, things were relaxed and hazardous. Some planes used glass dividers, which which put passengers at risk for nasty cuts if they hit turbulence. And of course, anyone who drove in those years knew seatbelts were usually an afterthought. Sometimes engines just fell right off, or pilots with less training than today had to try and not crash into another plane in the fog. Between the 50s and 60s, there was an average of around six crashes per year. End of an era. The golden age of flying is characterized by a kind of Hollywood splendor, where air travel was an elite, mysterious, risky, expensive, but grand treat that only a few dozen could sample. But as the years went on, more flight options entered the arena, and that meant more competition. Why do I need to pay a chunk of my salary to fly on this airline when another is offering a cheaper option and Spirit will carry me on their back for free? It has less amenities or none, but at least I'll get to my destination. Then, to keep up with the competition, airlines began playing a numbers game, reducing ticket prices and offering those luxuries at an extra cost. They got passengers on board, and they were a captive audience to shop with. Once air travel stopped being so exclusive, this meant less pressure for the staff to make a plane a flying palace, and passengers didn't have to dress in three-piece suits and evening gowns. Those who flew back then took a bigger risk, but also got a taste of the illustrious life while flying through the clouds. Was it all worth it? What do you remember about this golden age of flying? Do you remember the first time you were on an airplane? Where did you go? Was there anything a little antiquated about the experience? Write up your own postcards in the comments and we'll read them all. If you enjoyed our travels, be sure to hit the thumbs up icon for us. And subscribe to the channel so you never miss a memory. From all of us here at Do You Remember, we want to thank you for flying with us today and please prepare the cabin for landing.